When Susan Smith's story was first broadcast to the public, she appeared to be a distraught mother, desperate for the return of her two children who'd been kidnapped by a masked stranger. But the sympathy that she gained from the public quickly turned to suspicion as more and more evidence came to light, proving she might not be the innocent victim that she was claiming to be. This is the case of Susan Smith. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. You may be noting I'm wearing one of my favorite designs, which is Do Not Comply. If you fancy grabbing one of these blue camo hoodies, then get yourself online to look at them. They are very good quality. And as you know, I am pretty obsessed with the statement, Do Not Comply. I think it's applicable to a lot of things in my life. Also, thanks to all of you supporting me on YouTube membership and of course, Patreon. Without you, I can't make these, so you're amazing just to start off by saying that. And if you happen to have stumbled across my channel and have never watched me before, my name is Emma Kenny. I do deep dive crime content and I'm consistent. Crime and consistency is my catchphrase. That you'll always get them released on a Wednesday and a Sunday. And on a Sunday, I do try to be there for a live. So if you fancy a chat with an awesome community, and I mean an awesome, supportive, love the community, join me there. Today's case is one I wanted to cover because basically, potential parole date is coming around fast and that's going to leave some of us conflicted including myself let's talk about susan smith so susan Levorn, she was born september the 26th 1971 she was born in union south carolina i would say that she had a pretty dysfunctional and very unstable life growing up so her father harry ray he actually took his own life in 1977 when she was just six years of age. And by the age of six, you've experienced a lot in your world. You may not have huge memories of your life before that age, but you've got so many fundamental foundations that have been formed that instability and dysfunction and issues around parents who may be struggling are going to have hit you hard. The fact that her father takes his own life will have been immensely traumatic for a developing Susan Smith. And whilst that is not going to give her any leverage or excuse for the crime she involves herself in down the line, we do have to acknowledge that will have caused a massive trauma in her young life. Apparently, the way that she navigated that grief is by keeping his coin collection and also an audio recording of her father's voice. And that in itself is notable because it says that even as a very young child, she aligned herself with that human being as a person of meaning and that she wants to revisit that relationship by keeping listening to that audio recording and by having something that was of meaning to him. Also, I think we have to recognize that when a child loses a parent at that age, very often the world is very dismissive and it's not because adults are uncaring, it's that there is a myth that is peddled about children who lose people in their world and that is children are resilient they just get on with it when i used to work with the authority that i used to work for an education authority many years ago one of the things that i would do was go into schools and talk about how wrong we are for just assuming that children should return back to school the next day after losing a parent or just feel that that child's coping because they're playing with their friends what we know is that young children are so overwhelmed with the reality of what's played out that their brain essentially shuts down for a period of time. It cannot compute that they have been dealt such a horrible tragedy. And so they just go into auto mode. They just get on with everything as if nothing's really happened whilst their brain slowly digests the horror of what's unfolded. And the problem with that is that very often people just assume that they're fine. And then six months to 12 months down the line where their behavior becomes dysfunctional, no one is associating it with the grief that they've endured. And so it's really challenging when a child loses at this kind of age and it is pivotal and it will certainly have changed the experience of her as a young person. And we see that her mental health is certainly affected because by the age of 13, she actually tries to take her own life. And at 13 years of age, 
We want children because they are still absolutely children at that point. We want them to be enjoying their childhood. We want them to be enjoying spending time with their friends. We don't want them feeling a level of depression and anxiety. And for the most part, on the whole, children aren't enduring those very grown feelings, I suppose, that we associate more with people who've struggled in adulthood. But at 13, she literally does not want to be on this planet anymore. Her mother, Linda, then marries a guy called Beverly Russell. He's a thriving stockbroker. He's a member of the local chapter of the Christian Coalition. And this should have been symbolic of a change for the good in her life, because at the end of the day, financially, they're going to be in a better position. And also on a continuity level, having two parents can sometimes make it easier. And aside from that, having a father figure in your life or the additional parent to your life should prove something that benefits her as a girl growing up. But it doesn't, because Russell also sexually abused Smith when she was a teenager. So we've gone from a scenario where she's growing up, loses her primary carer, her father, and then meets a man who should, to all intents and purposes, make her life better and invariably makes it more chaotic and worse. By 1987, this is when she's 16 years of age, Smith tells her high school guidance counsellor and her mother Linda about the fact that Russell is abusing her. Linda then confronts her husband and he swears he wouldn't do it again, agreeing to family therapy, but continues abusing Susan in secret. Yes, I did genuinely just say that. So she confides in 1987 and this is a long time ago I appreciate but we genuinely were moving on to the point where sexual abuse was known to be a serious crime and where punishment against that crime would be a custodial sentence and rightly so and yet apparently when she confides bravely and courageously in the people who should stop this occurring by bringing in the law they decide that the best way forward is just to have a conversation with the sexual abuser, get him to say, oh, you know what, I won't do it anymore, and agree to family therapy. How utterly reprehensible is that decision? And when we look at fractures in people's foundations, that's going to be a huge one as far as Smith is concerned. And if we think about who can I trust, well, that's going to absolutely reinforce that Smith likely cannot trust anyone and it's really confusing for a girl of 16 years of age who's being horribly molested by the person who's meant to be taking care of her to navigate and negotiate emotionally what that will do to her because it means that people don't take the abuse seriously and also it will probably make her feel that she has a level of complicity in that that no one's actually getting angry to the degree that is required in this situation so maybe she's deserving of what's occurred and that can be so conflicting for an abused victim so again we absolutely have empathy and sympathy with smith at this moment in time it is disgusting that she does not get the support that she absolutely 100 percent needed and without a doubt deserved. He should have been locked up and that divorce should have been immediate, simple as, and it doesn't happen. We get to 1989. She graduates high school at this point and then she starts working at the Winn-Dixie supermarket. At this point, she again tries to take her own life. And the reason for this is it's triggered, shall we say, after a married man that she is in a relationship with ends their affair. So she swallows an overdose of aspirin and doctors then diagnose her with an adjustment disorder. So an adjustment disorder is basically a psychological condition. It's not a permanent condition, but it's one that is reactive usually to a stressor. In this case, it's reactive to this guy ending the relationship and it sends that person into a spiral of depression, anxiety. Sometimes that can be very immediate Sometimes they believe it can take up to three months, but diagnostically, it's not going to be a permanent situation. It's just that this person is really struggling to adjust to this new reality that they're dealing with. So again, she goes through a period of depression that leads her to thinking that there is no point being here. Doctors blame that on the stress that she's endured with the breakup. She then goes on to tell a psychiatrist that she's seeing that her affair, yes, that's how she described it because that's how badly she's failed. That her affair with her stepfather was consensual. 
So she said that she was jealous that her mother was receiving all the male attention. And so that's why she allowed it to happen. Now, this language is devastating because this is what happens when a child who's horrifically molested and abused and raped by a predator actually starts to own the situation because nobody took it seriously. So she is now using language that makes herself culpable. And that is tragic because it means she is going to be a whole heap of confused about sexual relationships per se. She is going to see herself as potentially only worth that. She's going to see herself as an individual who can only be validated that way potentially. These are all things that occur when people deal so dreadfully when somebody admits to the fact that they've been horribly molested. So now she is also the person responsible in her mind. Of course she isn't but that's the way she's viewing this situation. And the fact that she's saying that she was jealous that her mum was getting all the male attention, again, that tracks back to the fact that she has lost her father at a very young age. And aside from that, she's learned that the way to gain male attention, the male gaze, is to use her sexuality in her mindset. It's reprehensible because when you're a kid growing up, of course you start noticing as a teenager that men are looking at you some positively, some in a really leery negative way, but you recognise that there has been a transition, the way your body appears, the way that impacts on the world. However, grown adult men are meant to know that you don't know how to handle that, so they handle it for you by staying away from you, by having boundaries. Those boundaries have been breached, and now she feels responsible for that. We get to 1991, and it's unsurprising that as a really young woman, she gets married. Because, of course, this is how she's validating herself. So she marries a guy called David Smith, and this is because she finds out that she's pregnant. And pretty quickly, she has two sons. So Michael Daniel in 1991 and Alexander Tyler in 1993. And by the way, these boys are absolutely gorgeous. I know all children are beautiful. Goes without saying. But some children you look at and you're like, if I was going to put children in an advert, they'd get the job. They are like angels. And it's heartbreaking that we are talking, in this case, about the loss of these gorgeous human beings. It is fundamentally astounding to me that we can ever get to a scenario where we're talking about the deaths of children because no child deserves to die under any circumstances at any age per se. But there is just something wholly devastating when you see footage of these children and you're like, I would have opened my home to them in a heartbeat. And so many of you listening who talk to me in the comments section about the own struggles that you've had with not being able to have children yourselves, as I have in the past myself, opened up and shared about my own struggles, it's impossible to compute how children end up being murdered. It really is, because there are so many of us who would be willing in a heartbeat to prevent that happening by giving them a space and a place in our lives and our love. So this relationship with her husband now. It's rocky from the start. Of course it is. Why? Because the kids and she's got massive mental health issues. They've got personal struggles trying to act as grown-ups when they're not grown-ups. And it's very difficult when you have no comparisons to actually base your relationship on, aside from the abusive ones that you might have had in this case with her stepfather. So they have lots of arguments. There's mutual allegations of infidelity and they separate several times. So there's a level of dysfunction playing out now in their family life. Now, during one of those separations, Susan looks elsewhere to begin a relationship and she begins a relationship with a 27 year old guy called Tom Findlay. He's a graphic artist. He's also the son of a company owner. So he was kind of known as one of the most eligible bachelors in the union. So he's somebody that stands out to Smith because of the fact that he is essentially a really good catch. And bear in mind, she's looking probably to be validated through sex. Secondly, wants some firm foundations, even if that's unconscious. And this guy is kind of representing all of those possibilities. So with Tom Finley, Susan thinks that she's finally going to have this sense of stability in her life. But the problem is, Susan Smith isn't thinking with her head. She isn't. She's thinking with something much more impulsive. It's to do with her attraction towards him and potentially what he can provide. So she's not seeing the full picture. 
She's not thinking about his perspective regarding their relationship. Bear in mind, he's probably just having a little bit of fun because this woman is still in a relationship with her husband, albeit separated. She's got children. He's been provided probably with somebody who's quite sexually liberal because I would imagine due to all of her awful experiences, she probably provides him with a sexual plaything that he finds very alluring. But it's doubtful that he's thinking being the eligible bachelor with all the opportunities ahead of him, such as finding a woman without kids who doesn't have the issues that she presents with, he's just going to be playing around. He's not ready for a relationship. And that's exactly what plays out. He's not convinced that they're very different backgrounds and also Susan's behaviour towards other men because let's say she's had a few liaisons and that in itself suggests to him that maybe she isn't the kind of person that he'd want to settle down with. He feels that she's not going to be suitable for a really committed relationship. So he decides that he's going to send her a sort of Dear John letter I'm sure some of us have had those where an individual isn't brave enough to tell you how they actually feel. So they write it down, you know, so you can reread it 150 times as to why you're not the right person, just to reinforce that you are not the person that they want to spend their life with. I'm sure that people feel that it's positive to do that, but actually it's better to just have the conversation, let the individual speak back about their own feelings, let them ask the questions that they need, as opposed to you doing the whole it's not you, it's me. Here you are, written in a letter with bullet points as to why it's not you, it's me. But really you'll know in the bullet points it's uh, it's all about you. It's your, your life, your problem, it's not me at all. But anyway, that's what he does. October 1994 that she receives that and it's catastrophic for Susan because she struggles with her emotional regulation. She says that she just feels utterly alone. So we get to October the 25th, 1994. And this is where fundamentally everything changes for Smith and everyone who knows Smith, but in particular for those gorgeous boys that she'd been blessed with. So on October the 25th, 1994, Susan's found crying on the doorstop of a residence near John D. Lake. And she is claiming that her car has been stolen and that her three-year-old sons, Michael and 14-month-old Alex, had been kidnapped by a black man. So this horrific event has played out, and this guy has basically stolen a car and hasn't allowed her to take her children. And for nine days, she and David are pleading with the press for the safe return of their sons. Lots of televised appeals. Very strange watching them. Very strange indeed. Because... The way that she appears, it feels very staged. One of the interviews, she just has her eyes closed the entire time. And I don't know, let's just put it out there. As a mother, if somebody had carjacked my car and stolen my children, first off, if you were getting me on TV, you'd probably have to have somebody with a sedating injection next to me because I would be hysterical. I wouldn't be able to string a sentence together. My hair certainly wouldn't be done. I would literally look 100 years old and like I'd gone 50 rounds with a very good boxer. That's how I would look. My eyes would be swollen. I would look nothing like I look right now because all I would be caring about is getting my children home. That's not how she appears. It's very odd when you watch her in these appeals. Please let me take them. And he said, no, we didn't have time because they were in car seats and it was going to take time for me to get them out of the car seat. And um, they just told me, he said, but I won't hurt them. And he just took off. But he had a gun. And then my my big thing is they were screaming, hollering, crying. I involved for them and that they are being taken care of and that they are safe and that they will return home safely. I want to say to my baby, and your mama loves you so much. And your daddy and his whole family love you so much. And you guys have got to be strong because you are, we, 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 I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay. But you got to take care of each other. And to many of the people who knew her, so friends, acquaintances, and most importantly, the authorities, they instantly know that something's really wrong. 
First of all, they're going to spend a lot of time going through exactly what played out. This is what they need to do when they're interviewing Smith. They need to figure out how do we piece together these events? How do we bring to justice this guy who apparently has stolen your car and your children? And let's just put this into context as well. If somebody carjacks you, that's terrifying. Somebody is armed and they're telling you to get out of your car and you are in a situation where you're going to hand that car over. Are you telling me that that person is like, oh, there's two kids in the back. It's not going to cause an issue. It's not going to go from a carjacking, which is serious enough to a kidnap of children. I'll oh, just take them. Be fine. Said nobody robbing a car ever. You don't want the kids there. You want them out. There's a mother willing to take them. So get them out of the car seat. Move on. Yes, she's going to be left by the roadside with two children. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's a lot less likely you're going to get apprehended for that crime because nobody's concerned about the two kids that were in the car who've been stolen, which was going to present an enormous amount of press. So that in itself, psychologically, as somebody who would be stealing a car, that doesn't make sense. If you want a car, you want a car. You're not thinking, is this a quick route to adoption? No one's going to think that's weird when I turn up with two white kids. You know, that's the reality that we'd be looking at. It makes no sense. And all of her story is just riddled with holes. So each time she's asked about the incident, she'd change a story. And an interesting thing from an interview that I watched with a police officer about Susan Smith is he was the person who was interrogating her and first interviewing her before she's arrested for any of these issues. And he said she was very quick to close down any potential of her being accused to the point where they knew she was going to be a real stern character. This wasn't somebody who was breaking and struggling. It was like she had a story, she was sticking to it and that he felt they were going to have to be very clever and manipulative in the way that they interrogated her and interviewed her to actually get to the root of the story. So she's quite a steely character, according to that individual. They also get her to do several polygraph tests. These are inconclusive, although there is a report that she failed one. But nonetheless, she's going ahead and doing them, which is obviously trying to suggest, look, I'm innocent. Why would I be actually having these polygraph tests if I was guilty? And again, we can always absolutely bring in the legitimacy of polygraph tests. The reason that they are not put in court, they're not considered appropriate, is purely because it's very easy for them to get wrong. In fact, they believe that it can be like the toss of a coin situation. I believe that one of the highest statistics is 65% they'll be effective and the rest of the time they won't be. So I don't think that failing a polygraph test is always going to demonstrate somebody's guilt. If you're highly stressed, etc., that can be a problem too. But none of them are working out in her favour, shall we say. Now, by the second day of the investigation, the police genuinely think that she knows exactly where the children are. And they're hoping at this point, of course they are, that the kids are still alive. And one of the big issues that her friends are facing is the atypical language that Smith is engaged in when talking to them because her children have disappeared, apparently stolen by a black man. And you would therefore imagine that the only conversation that would be occurring would probably go from, I can't be here anymore. I don't want to live on this planet anymore because my children are not present. You know, I can imagine there would be that kind of talk that you didn't want to go on. Or there would be the, how do we find them? What can I do? I'd probably be out driving about everywhere, etc. You would be consistently engaged, fixated, obsessed with your children. Not Smith. Smith keeps asking friends if Tom Findlay is coming to see her. Now, I do appreciate she had strong feelings with Tom Finlay, but at the end of the day, he's going to be the last thing on your mind. With respect, I'd probably be thinking, how can I pin some of the blame on Tom Finlay for making me feel so bad that I was driving around that day with my kids in the car because I needed to clear my mind, which arguably she said she needed to, and now my kids have been nicked. I'd probably be doing a voodoo doll that I've designed of Tom Finlay just to make myself feel better. But this isn't the case. She wants him to come and visit her. She wants him to see her. And I suppose some people can argue, well, maybe that's because he represented a sense of safety for her. Maybe that's because she genuinely felt comforted around him. Oh, well, if that's the case, 
get out the dear John letter because I'm sure there'll be enough points there to deflect from wanting to see him. So that's causing concern. But I guess the biggest breakthrough that comes in her description of the carjacking location. So she claims that a traffic light had turned red and that obviously would cause you to stop at this otherwise empty intersection, conveniently empty. Uh, so what was happening with the car? Well, I got to this intersection and it went red. So I stopped. Were there any other cars around? No, there were no cars anywhere to be seen in the entire area. Absolutely no chance there was a car drive. There was no cars. It was red. I stopped. I had a chance to glance around all the intersection and I was actually able to measure and about 2,000 metres each way. No car. Nada. Literally not a chance of a witness. Really sad. It's sad because it would be good to have had a witness, but at the end of the day, no witnesses anywhere. I can absolutely confirm. It's a shame I haven't got a dash cam and that technology was not invented because I would be able to demonstrate that there were no witnesses who could in any way question my story of authenticity, which some could see as convenient, but I just see as a bit of a shame. So that's what she says. It was empty. However, the problem with that particular story that she so cleverly has constructed is that they determined that the light would never have actually turned red unless the vehicle was present on the intersecting road. So almost a perfect plan. Unfortunately, you don't understand how these things work. And she didn't. And so that's a big hole in her story. So this immediately conflicts with a statement that she didn't see any other cars when the carjacking took place. And now the police, as far as they are concerned, have got a really big piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And so they confront her with this. So on November the 3rd, after nine days of intense scrutiny and media attention, and I mean the local community were totally obsessed with what was going on. It was international news that these two children had been taken, but the local community, my God, they were searching everywhere. They were on horseback. They were totally, totally obsessed with bringing these children home. They were so engaged. So you can imagine that we're talking about a nine day period from those boys disappearing to the point that we're discussing now, where the community have felt a part of this case so they have been very sympathetic initially to Smith they've cared deeply about her boys and yet on November the 3rd after all of this scrutiny and media attention after these nine days Susan Smith confesses now according to former agent Logan Susan actually fell to her knees and she was crying hysterically when she told the truth. So we can appreciate that whatever that veneer that she held, which was apparently quite steely, and even though she was chatting about her boyfriend and wanting him to come and see her rather than discussing the children, it feels a little bit like she was withholding a great deal of emotion that then just comes out when she confesses. But can we just make it clear? This will be for her. This will be because the game is up. I am not for one minute believing that Susan Smith has a conscience about her boys. Please feel free to dispute this in the comments. But for me, I just don't buy it. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children, Michael three and Alexander 14 months. The vehicle, a 1990 Mazda, driven by Smith, was located late Thursday afternoon in Lake John D. Long near Union. Two bodies were found in the vehicle's back seat. So this is what she confesses. She says that around 3.30 p.m. on the 25th of October 1994, she leaves the company where she worked as a secretary. She's upset because she's dealing with this breakdown in the relationship between her and a relationship with Tom Finley. She then drives to the daycare centre. This is where her two gorgeous boys were being looked after. She collects her infant children there. And she just can't get the thought of Tom Finlay or the relationship that's broken down with him out of her mind. So she ends up stopping at a tavern on the way home. She's in the car park there. And she speaks to a friend from there for a period of time, just kind of talking about how upset she is. She then returns to the office with her children. She's basically hoping to patch things up with him and this then proves unsuccessful. 
She's clearly, we can tell therefore, desperate to reconcile. And her thoughts are not with her kids. Because again, I know that we have all got lives and I know that when you're in a relationship with somebody or when it's breaking down, it's gonna be a bit of an obsession at times. But when you have kids, they are your priority. They're the people that you care for most. They're the people that you take care of most. You don't have them in the back of the car whilst you go and try and patch things up with your ex because you're thinking about what they need, what their priorities are required to meet in that situation, such as getting them home, feeding them, letting them play, you know, being kids. But this desperation sounds like an obsession because all she's concerned about, in spite of Tom Finley being very clear about the fact that they're not going to be able to be together, is to somehow find a way to make him see that she's the girl for him. Now, around 6 p.m., she gets home. At this point, she makes the boys dinner of pizza. Apparently, she calls a friend who worked at the tavern to see if Tom was there and if he'd asked about her. I don't know about you guys. We've all been through breakdowns in relationships, haven't we? It happens. But most of us don't imagine that our ex is going to be in a bar having a chat with friends about you. You know, if they'd broken it off with you, the only reason they'd be asking or talking about you is if they thought you were a bit scary and maybe a little bit too intense and they'd be moaning about you. Or they'd be talking about what a lucky escape they'd had. They're not going to be mourning the loss of you and discussing it with the friends and staff at the tavern. And that just introduces us, in my opinion, to a bit of a narcissistic tendency there. Because she thinks that there is a hope or a chance that he's there discussing her, the most important person in the world. Now, it turns out he is there, and that will have annoyed her, but he hadn't mentioned her unsurprisingly now, this would have wounded her of course it would and probably it would have added to the desperation and it might also have made her feel really angry because she wants him to care now between 7 30 and 8 p.m she straps the children into the car seats in the back of a 1990 mazda potage she said that the reason for this is she wanted to drive around she wanted to go through the countryside she wanted to look at the scenery just to clear her thoughts so she ends up driving around union for an hour, she's feeling really lonely. She's feeling very suicidal and that would make sense. She, as we know, reacts very badly to stress. She's in love with this guy in her mind that's rejected her and she has been suicidal before. So it is in context with her past behavior. But now she's got two little boys in the car. So she says that she pulled into an access road at John D Lake and originally she's planning to roll into the lake with her car and she said that the reason for that is she decided that she wanted to take her own life but obviously she couldn't trust anybody to bring up her children so she thought well I'll take them with me I don't know just throwing it out there just give your children to your ex-partner you know the father of them I'm just going to throw it out there he'd be more than happy to take them so that makes no sense whatsoever but apparently after deciding to do that she abandons that plan and instead gets out and watches as the car in neutral rolls into the water that's right when she initially was going to do it she took the handbrake off started to roll down a little bit and stopped herself because she was in the car but then with the car in neutral and we all know what that means if it's in neutral a little push it's going to roll down very nicely and slowly into that lake she actually removes herself from the vehicle and allows that to happen. So at this point, she's able to give the authorities the location of the car. How horrific. What I've described there is a mother actively watching as her gorgeous little innocent boys at the very beginning of their lives literally roll into a lake to drown. The horror the terror, the confusion, the chaos, as those little children start to compute what is happening. And you can bet your bottom dollar they would have been screaming for their mummy. There is no doubt whatsoever. She would have been the first and the last thing on their mind as they swallowed that water 
and they died in the most heinous of ways. And she just watched. She just watched. Now, I could shift to a level of empathy if I considered that this woman had been sat in that car with her children. Would I have thought it was acceptable? 100% not. Would I have seen that as a woman in a mental decline who was taking her own life and had the delusion that those boys would be safer with her in heaven than on this planet? Yes, I would have had a level of sympathy because I would have known there is something going on that is deeply distressing for this human being. She's in an inordinate amount of mental distress and this delusion is why she's acting this way. That's not what happened. I could even stretch to a little bit of sympathy and empathy if she had allowed that car to start rolling and as it started to go into the water, she had realised what she'd done and she had got in there and tried her best to free those boys, potentially drowning herself, and in failing to drown herself in freeing them, she would have been found absolutely soaked, totally dishevelled, hysterical, explaining to the authorities what had happened. Again, a little bit of me could stretch to some sympathy, empathy, and an understanding of mental dysfunction. That's not what's happened. She's watched it play out. She's gathered her thoughts. She's created a story. And now she's going to try and get away with the cold-blooded murders of those beautiful boys. So now she's given the information to the investigators. They start to search the nearby lakes and nearby ponds. This is including the John D. Long Lake. Now, initially, and sadly, the searches didn't actually locate the car because police had thought it would be around 30 feet off the shore. So they didn't actually search very much further, but it turned out to be 122 feet from the shore under 80 feet of water. Those boys taken to their murky, wet graves. It's horrific. When they find the bodies of a boys, the first person who comes across the car says that they noted a hand on the window, a little baby hand pressed against the window. Isn't that horrific? Both of them were still strapped into their car seats. It's harrowing to imagine how that would have felt for those undercover divers because as well can we all get real about how gruesome that scene would have been when children have been underwater for nine days their bodies will just be bloated and disfigured and that would mean as well that all those family members who loved them dearly they'd never get to see them again never get to kiss their forehead goodbye never get to see them for one last time that's denied and again, that's another thing that she steals from the family, not just those boys, but their chance to say goodbye. Now, the police angle, they come up with the fact that the motivation is purely to do with facilitating a relationship with John Finley. He didn't want a relationship involving children, basically. That's what he had made clear. He was also a really wealthy businessman because of the fact that his dad owned businesses and that meant that he was in line for a lot of money and he was considered in the local area to be, you know, a really good catch and she liked that. Now, Susan, when she's interviewed, she said there was no motive, she didn't plan the murders and just said she wasn't in the right state of mind. And I'm going to read you the following confession because this is what she wrote. When I left my home on Tuesday, October the 25th, I was very emotionally distraught. I didn't want to live anymore. I felt like things could not get any worse. I was going to ride around a little while and then go to my mum's. As I rode and rode and rode, I felt even more anxiety coming up from me, not wanting to live. I felt I couldn't be a good mum anymore, but I didn't want my children to grow up without a mum. I felt I had to end our lives to protect us from any grief or harm. I'd never felt so lonely and so sad in my entire life. And I was in love with someone very much, but he didn't love me and never would, and I had a difficult time accepting that. But I had hurt him very much, and I could see why he could never love me. When I was at John D. Long Lake, I never felt so scared and unsure as I did then. I wanted to end my life so bad. I was in my car, ready to go down that ramp into the water, and I did go part way, but I stopped. I went again, I stopped. And then I got out of the car and stood by the car, a nervous wreck. Why was I feeling this way? 
Why was everything so bad in my life? I had no answers to these questions. I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down the ramp into the water without me. I took off, screaming, oh God, oh God, no, what have I done? Why did you let this happen? I wanted to turn around so bad and go back, but I knew it was too late. I was an absolute mental case. I couldn't believe what I'd done. I love my children with all my heart. That will never change. I've prayed to them for forgiveness and I hope that they find it in their heart to forgive me. I never meant to hurt them. I'm sorry for what's happened and I know that I need some help. I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive myself for what I've done. My children, Michael and Alex, are with our Heavenly Father now and I know that they'll never be hurt again. As a mum, that means more than words could ever say. I knew from day one the truth would prevail, but I was so scared I didn't know what to do. It was very tough emotionally to sit and watch my family hurt like they did. It was time to bring a peace of mind to everyone, including myself. My children deserve to have the best, and now they will. I broke down on Thursday, November the 3rd, and I told Sheriff Howard Wells the truth. It wasn't easy, but after the truth was out, I felt like the world was lifted off my shoulders. I know now that this is going to be a tough and long road ahead of me. At this very moment, I don't feel I will be able to handle what's coming, but I've prayed to God that he gives me strength to survive each day and to face those times and situations in my life that will be extremely painful. I have put my total faith in God and he will take care of me. Honestly, I could spend three hours totally dissecting that, but narcissism again it's cropping up it's playing in to what's going on there it's all about her and oh we don't have to worry about the kids oh yeah don't worry about the kids hang on didn't you murder the children in a really horrible way yeah yeah yeah. but don't don't worry about that yeah i did but at the end of the day like they're fine now they're like in the best place like they're with god it's all cool yeah i know but didn't you just deny them their entire future ah oh, yeah i did do that i did it yeah i did but at the end of the day it's just fast track them to being in bliss and never being hurt again. So like, am I a bad person? That my children now are literally living their best lives with God. So am I a murderer or could I be a savior? No, you're, you're, def you're definitely a murderer. Well, am I a murderer or am I a savior? No, like 100%, we put this out to, a vote, you are 100% a murderer, but am I, or am I a savior? You are evil. Well, God's fine with me. I've prayed, he says it's cool. I genuinely think that when you die, there's going to be a really quick lift down. You know that your kids ended up all those meters below the surface? Well, imagine that to the center of the earth, where it's molten and burning, and where, I don't know, bad things happen. Anyway, that's what she says. Now she's gonna be given strength to face all these horrible things she'll have to face that basically she doesn't deserve because her kids are absolutely fine. It's unsurprising that later the investigation revealed that the detectives had pretty much doubted Smith's story from day one. They believed that she'd murdered her sons. They needed to get the evidence to provide that that was true, but they knew that they were looking at her. The story became international news. It was landing on the cover of People magazine with the headline, Does She Deserve to Die? Because people were just enraged. Firstly, because she's killed these two gorgeous children, but also because she denied it and she'd literally manipulated people for days. She'd played with their emotions all the while knowing where her little boys were. So after Susan gets arrested for the murders of Michael and Alex, she's held without bail at the York County Jail. The same evening that she's arrested, Beverly and Linda Russell, they hired David Brooke. So he's an attorney and he specialised in the death penalty cases. They wanted him to represent Susan, essentially, so that she could not be put to death. They wanted to save a life. And they were eventually forced to mortgage the home to pay for Brooke's services, which I don't care about at all because Russell basically is a rapist and a child molester and Linda supported him. So I hope they did lose their home. Just personal feelings they're coming across, but I'm sure that a lot of you align with them. So prior to defending Smith, Brooke had only lost three out of 50 cases where the death sentence was concerned. So this guy knows what he's doing. 
Brooke, in turn, hired Judith Clark, so that's another death penalty expert. Clark also worked on the Unabomber case, and that ultimately saved him from being sentenced to death. So these are hard hitters. A few days before the start of a trial, Susan's pastor, Mark Long, held this press conference to reveal, wait for it, that Susan had undergone a jailhouse Christian conversion and baptism. That's right. Let's get a press conference. Why are we getting the press conference? Because God has come and saved Susan Smith. How is that going to change anything? God changes everything. She could be considered to be a murderer. She could be considered to be a cold-hearted bitch. But no, she's now a Christian. So we should definitely not kill her. Again, I really hate those marketing techniques. It's like, are we forgiving her now? Because she's had a Christian conversion and baptism? Because if so, you're going to be busy. There's going to be a big queue of people wanting them. From shoplifters to sadists, they'll all be doing it, won't they? We get to July the 11th, 1995. At this point, Judge Howard ruled that Susan Smith was mentally competent to stand trial. This is even though Donald Morgan, so Dr. Donald Morgan was the prosecution psychiatrist. He actually stated that Susan could sabotage her own defence because she wanted to die. So there is some concern over the fact that Susan Smith is so desperate to be put to death that she's going to basically conflict the situation to a point where they're going to go kill her. But again, I'm not too sure that that's reality. I'm going to throw it out there. I know that Susan Smith has been horribly suicidal in the past. And as I've said, I felt very sorry for what happened to her. However, I also think she's very manipulative, which is what we've just seen when she manipulated the entire world, pretending that she'd had nothing to do with her children's death and that a black man was responsible for stealing him. So she seems pretty compassmentous then. And also, somebody may think that they're suicidal and want to die. But then when they find out that actually they have no control over it and they're going to die, they can act very differently. In this case, their survival instinct kicks in and she may well be manipulating the psychiatrist to believe that she is somebody who wants to die in a way to make them feel that this would not be a punishment. It won't be a punishment. She wants to die. So let's just look at doing something like life imprisonment and so on and so forth. We get to Tuesday, July the 18th, 1994. This is when the trial is set to start. But the Union County Courthouse actually received a bomb threat that required everyone to evacuate the building. The man who actually did that was quickly found and arrested. Probably an ex of Susan Smith. It wasn't an ex of Susan Smith. Sorry, I'm just throwing that in for an artistic license. It's very serious. Don't do that to the local county courthouse. It's a very bad thing and you get into serious trouble. So the opening statements of the trial begin on Wednesday, the 19th, July, 1995. The prosecution... They say that basically the jurors have to hold on to their common sense. So special prosecutor Keith Gies, he's basically wanting to paint the picture of her being a, quote, selfish, manipulative killer who sacrificed her own children for the love of an ex-boyfriend. And he said this, we're going to go back over the nine days of lies, the nine days of trickery. The nine days of begging this country to help find her children when the whole time they lay dead at the bottom of that lake. So he's very hard going down that line of she planned this. And they also said, look at it in the eye, face to face and see it for the unspeakable horror that it is. The defence, their opening statement given by Clark, asked the jurors to look into the hearts and to see Susan is this disturbed childlike figure who after a lifetime of sadness just snapped told the jury this is not a case about evil this is a case about despair and sadness so the defense's strategy is basically to outline Susan's emotional turmoil that led to her drowning her two sons though I will say they didn't say that she was insane or mentally ill so they're not going down that road, but they're kind of saying the scars from the past have drowned those children for her, so to speak. Now, throughout the trial, Susan sat at the defence table and she'd be quietly reading a newspaper or she'd be fidgeting with small 
objects so she's not very engaged shall we say and when you bear in mind that she's on trial for this horrific crime you may think that paying attention would be in her benefit because if someone is just reading a newspaper or fidgeting all the time it doesn't feel like you are present and you should really be present if you're going to take responsibility and accountability for the horrors of what you've done she'd been jailed for eight months by this point and i would say that they'd already taken a real toll on her appearance so she's an attractive woman when she was growing up without a doubt and when she wasn't in prison she did have to some degree quite a youthful appearance quite a childlike appearance and the defense are playing on that but those eight months inside have really changed her appearance and she does seem a lot older at that time than her 23 years so quite dowdy appearance she was wearing very plain conservative ill-fitting suits and she had these wire rimmed glasses so it's hard to align the childlike demeanor and experiences that they're trying to project as to why she is the person that she is onto what now looks like a more middle-aged individual now the prosecution's case was led by a guy called Tommy Pope. He was only 32. He was the youngest prosecutor in the state of South Carolina. And they start calling the witnesses. So one of the first witnesses to testify was Sheriff Howard Wells. And he actually talks about how he tricked Susan into confessing with a small lie of his own. So when interviewing Susan on the 3rd of November, he disputed that story about her being stopped at the red traffic light because his sheriff deputies were conducting surveillance, yet he admitted in court this wasn't true. He just wanted to see if a story would break. So he kind of introduced this lie, which we all know they do. It's one of those things that people are often unaware of, that you can completely lie about certain information, people saying that you've done things, etc., to break you into telling the truth. It might seem a little bit unfair, but obviously the interest in the investigators is to get you to admit to a crime. Also, Roy Paschal, that's the person who drew that composite sketch of the carjacker that she said had stolen the car. He said Susan Smith was really vague. So when she's describing the alleged carjacker's physical appearance, she couldn't really quantify the type of look that he had. And it was difficult for them to get a steer on who this person could have been. You'd think if somebody had literally taken the time to carjack you and tell you that they're not gonna let you get your kids out of the car, it's gonna be stained and etched into your memory. So that doesn't look well for her. Then we've got David Espy, that was the FBI agent who administered several polygraph tests. They said that one of the really disconcerting things about Susan Smith was she'd make sobbing noises, but when he looked in her eyes, there was literally no water no tears. She reminds me of Diane Downs. If you haven't seen my Diane Downs coverage, please do go and have a look at that video because genuinely it's a very similar reality. In fact, it's quite a similar story in many ways. There's also a guy called Steve Morrow. That's a diving expert and one of the divers who actually looked for the missing car. He testified that along with the bodies of Michael and Alex Smith, he also found a letter from Tom Findlay telling Susan that their relationship was over and that was in the car. So that doesn't look good for her because she has a motivation to act in the way that she acts to protect or hopefully change the outcome of the relationship that had failed. So Pope then produces Tom's letter in court. Apparently it was two pages long and it said things like this. There are some things about you which aren't suited for me. And yes, I am speaking about your children. I'm sure that your kids are good kids, but it really wouldn't matter to me how good they may be. The fact is, I just don't want children. Now, one can look at that and see it for the bare bones it is and say, he just didn't want kids and the kids were a problem. <laughs> or we can think, he wanted to break it off with Susan Smith. He didn't think that they were going to work and you're going to find a solid reason. You can't change the fact you've got your kids. And Tom Finley would have believed that because... No mother's going to abandon those children for him. Surely that would be in his mind. So it gives him a get out without seeming like a bad person. Oh, you know, you're amazing. This would have been a great relationship. But unfortunately, you've got children and I don't want children. So it's going to be a no from me. And she cannot change that. It's an immovable fact. And that's the distressing part. Because maybe if he hadn't written that letter and specifically said the children were the problem, we wouldn't be talking about this case today. I'm not blaming him. He couldn't have possibly known what was being manifested in her mind when she was considering that letter and how to change the outcome. 
but certainly it does feel like that's a huge motivator. Tom Findlay, he goes and testifies and he says that yes, he broke up with Susan because he just wasn't willing to be in a relationship with children, but also he had issues with her full stop. He had issues about their relationship together. And then there's three of Susan's co-workers who testify that on three separate occasions, she actually told them how she wondered often about whether her life would be different if she hadn't got children, if she hadn't got married at such a young age. And the answer, Susan Smith, is yes, of course it would have been different because you wouldn't have had kids or been married. But that doesn't mean it would have been better. That doesn't mean that you'd have felt fulfilled. It doesn't mean that Tom Findlay would have loved you. It just would have meant you had a different life. Everybody could make a decision differently to the life that they're living presently. It doesn't mean the outcome will be any better. But she's obviously thinking about this and imagining a life that would have been better, that the grass feels greener on the other side in spite of it really being so in reality. The state's final witness, well, that was pathologist Dr. Sandra Conradi. They performed the autopsies on Michael and Alex and concluded that it was indeed drowning that had caused the death. One of the things that Judge Howard refused, however, was to allow the prosecutors to show the horrific pictures of the children because they'd been submerged in that lake for nine long days and it would have been very harrowing for the jury. And with respect, she had said that she was guilty, so that means that it wasn't necessary anyway. Also, that judge prohibited prosecutors from asking questions about the decayed nature of the bodies because again, the descriptions were so terrible that they might be prejudicial. Is it prejudicial? Is it prejudicial? It's, it's, it is prejudicial. Is it prejudicial just describing the bodies of the babies because you're saying I can't bring in the pictures? Well, no, the pictures are too terrible. They're horrific. The jurors would be traumatized by it. And the jurors here to decide really what happens next and you know whether, for example, this woman is deserving of some very severe ramifications for her crime. Yes, but I mean, these pictures are terrible. Can we potentially just describe the pictures so that we can give them a feeling for what went on. No, 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 because that could bias them. But is that not why we're here? Is it, is it not why we're It's my job as a prosecutor not to just bias the jury in the direction of guilt and the heinous level of the crime. That makes sense, but I'm still saying it's a no. Anyway, Conradi testified that she received the bodies of the two boys and at the time that she received them, they were still strapped in their car seats. She also said that neither of the children were wearing shoes. I mean, that's quite typical, isn't it? That you take your kids out in the car for a drive, they're not necessarily going to be wearing shoes. Now, the state's case was expected to last two weeks, but Judge Howard prevented the full case being presented against Susan. And... It makes sense to a degree because Susan Smith had already confessed to the murder of her sons and that meant that her solicitors were basically left with very few choices to actually defend her. So they opted to plead that she was suffering from severe mental depression and that the murders were actually a failed suicide attempt in which she'd planned to drown herself as well as her two sons, even though she clearly didn't because only her two sons died and she wasn't wet when she was found. Therefore, meaning that she didn't even try to drown at any point. Just going to throw it out there. It's a very weak defence, isn't it? On Thursday, the 20th of July, 1995, the defence case begins. So, as I've said, you know, I have a very strong case and she's already said she's guilty. So now it's about mitigation, isn't it? So they call Arlene Andrews. She was a social worker at the University of South Carolina. And she testifies about this family tree that she's constructed of Susan Smith's family, which just all showed a really strong history of severe depression. It's evidenced by several suicide attempts and actual successful suicides by members of family of Susan. So that demonstrates potentially some genetic construction or a behavioural reality being brought up with a family who struggle and this therefore being passed on on a nurture level potentially. Then we've got Jenny Ward. She was a caseworker and she told the court that in 1989, she investigated Susan Smith's allegation that age 15, she had been molested by her stepfather, Beverly Russell. And these were charges that Beverly Russell admitted. And she said, look, this is child abuse, it's sexual abuse, and it's criminal in nature. So argued that she had been a victim of crime. And we all know that's true. 
Now, despite this, the Smith family didn't actually press charges, as we know, against Russell. And the belief is that it's because they were intimidated. So this is what Ward, the social worker, said, that Russell had this strong affiliation with the local Republican Party and that the matter had been sealed because of that. And she said, that's the only order I've had sealed in 20 years. So basically, Susan Smith is horrifically failed. And the way that that case is managed is to literally seal it away. And that's really corrupt. And that means that Susan Smith had a massive failure of protection because of the power that Russell had. Now, under cross-examination, one of the things that Ward was forced to admit was that Smith had never actually appeared troubled or suicidal at the time. But with respect, I don't think that means anything. Just because somebody doesn't appear at that time to be troubled or suicidal doesn't mean that they don't have those deep feelings. And it certainly doesn't mean that she wasn't failed because she absolutely was. We get to Friday 21st of July. This is where Dr. Seymour Halleck, who's a star witness, essentially, they testified that Susan had suffered from depression and suicidal thoughts leading up in the months to the murders. She'd also started drinking very heavily. Susan had also had sex with four different men during the six weeks prior to the murders. So she'd had sex with Beverly Russell. That's right, her stepfather. Tom Findlay, Carrie Findlay, Tom's father, and David Smith. Mm. Do you want me to run through those again? So she had had sex with four different men during the six weeks prior to the murders, and they included her stepfather, Beverly Russell, Tom Finley, the guy that she's apparently in love with, Carrie Finley, his father, because why not keep it in the family, and David Smith. I'm going to throw it out there that if you really want a relationship with Tom Findlay, it's probably best if you don't have sex with his dad. Just gonna give that life advice right there. Probably best to remove yourself from any kind of intercourse with direct relatives of said intended person that you wanna be with. And again, I appreciate that we're dealing with somebody who maybe manages a level of validation and worth through sexual connection, but she also is causing herself catastrophic impact on the relationship with Tom Findlay by doing what I've just said. Now, she says the reason that she was having these sexual relationships is because they temporarily eased her depression. We do see people using sex to alleviate their pain, to self-medicate their pain at times, but it's obviously something that was causing her enormous about of dysfunction in her life. And she even said that it used to make her feel immensely guilty afterwards. Mm. It would and should when you're sleeping with the father of the guy you want to be with. So this is an attempt by the defence to poke holes in the prosecution's theory that Susan murdered her children to rekindle the relationship with Tom. It's kind of like, hey, why would she kill her kids? Hadn't caused her a problem with having sex with all these other guys. She didn't care about Tom. She was having sex with his father. So why would you do that if you cared about this relationship? You wouldn't be having sex with his father, your stepfather, your ex kind of husband, and Tom, if you were that concerned about your relationship with Tom. And I'm not, not sure that that makes sense as far as poking holes goes anyway. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of poking going on, but I'm not saying poking holes is the poking holes that we've just been discussing right there. I think it's a whole other type of poking holes. But I get where they were going that she would not be motivated to kill her children because this relationship wasn't one that was too important to her because she's having sex with everybody else. So she said that the survival instinct took over and forced Susan from the car as it rolled into the lake with her two children inside. So that's the reason that this apparently happened. It's not that Susan wanted to live, it's that she wanted to die with her kids but somehow, as the car was rolling towards the lake, the survival instinct just kicks in and she's out without thinking. And then she's alive and they're dead. Well, you know what? That instinct should also mean call an ambulance, scream for help, jump in, try and get your children out. 
That would also be an instinct we'd expect. Because with respect, survival instinct is usually usurped by a maternal instinct, you know, where you risk your life to do anything to protect your children. That's what we would normally expect. Women and men run into burning buildings and injure themselves beyond belief, bringing their pets out, let alone their children. Can we all acknowledge what the defense is doing is not actually making sense. It just makes us seem selfish. So then there are closing arguments, 22nd of July, 1995. Now, Pope reinforced the idea that Smith murdered her two children to rekindle her past relationship. They said she used the emergency brake handle like a gun and eliminated her toddlers so that she could have a chance at a life with Tom Findlay, the man she said she loved. Whereas Clark was a tad less dramatic, so continued to basically appeal for the jurors' sympathy, stating that Susan had never shown anything except unconditional love for her children. There was no malice in what she did. It was not murder. Susan was given the chance to address the jury herself, but didn't take it. Interestingly, they actually had a jury made up of eight white people and four black people, and I think that was really important because we can't forget, can we, that she was trying to implicate a black man in the crime. And we know enough about crime to understand that sometimes innocent people are sent to prison for crimes that they didn't commit because crimes are pinned on them. So she put black men in danger by that lie. Now, when it comes down to the conviction, it was in a ruling that I would say surprised and very much upset the prosecution and the Smith family too, because Judge Howard he ruled in favour of a defence motion that could have allowed the jury to consider a lesser charge of involuntary manslaughter. Now, if the jury had actually chosen that, of involuntary manslaughter, should have faced a sentence of three to ten years in prison for the double homicide of her kids in a horrendously torturous fashion. Fortunately, I don't know, because the jury have brains. It took only two and a half hours to convict her on two counts of first degree murder. Now, when it came to the sentencing, so this is the penalty phase, Tommy Pope argued immediately in favour of sentencing Smith to death. Beverly Russell actually appeared on the stand. Yeah, her stepfather. He went on that stand to plead with the jury not to take Smith's life. Read aloud from a letter he wrote to her while she was in jail. He said, I want you to know you do not have all the guilt in this tragedy. My heart breaks for what I have done to you. Why is he not in prison? Why have we got a sexual molester and perpetrator on a stand apologizing for the abuse over this child when she was a kid? Why is he just allowed to do that? There is something so broken here. There is something so broken. This is a sexual predator and he's allowed to just say how bad he feels for screwing up a life in a court of law. Call me logical, but that seems totally wrong. The lead defence lawyer, David Brooke. This is interesting. They go with this. He tells the jury that the greatest punishment for Mrs Smith would be life in prison, not death. Which the state psychologist and other witnesses had testified that she absolutely longed for. He said this. Grief is not a monopoly of the prosecution's side. Adding that, Mrs. Smith has suffered a lifetime of deep depression and that her death would bring only more grief to a family that has already seen enough. Well, I get it, but at the end of the day, if you do the crime and all that, you need to be aware of the consequences. Ultimately, the jury did vote against imposing the death penalty, so she gets sentenced to a life in prison in 1995 for the murders of her two sons, and rightly so. I do have to say, though, it kind of gets me when they're like, it's a fate worse than death, life imprisonment. Is it really a fate worse than death? It's a fate worse than death. She didn't want to be here. She was suicidal. So if you kill her, she gets what she wants. So instead, let her spend the rest of her life in prison being fed, being sheltered, being given jobs, eating food, getting to see members of her family if they want to see her, devoting herself to new passions and interests, all with the possibility of a future where she's released. Is that, is that, that's, it's not, I don't know. It's, the way you've just described it there just doesn't seem like a fate worse than death. 
She's going to have to do things like art classes. She's going to be given a job. She's going to be able to socialise and have friends. She'll be able to watch TV. She'll be able to forge and form new relationships. Might be able to do a degree. And she'll be able to assert herself in these roles throughout her prison time, probably to a point where other prisoners are respectful towards her. Again, I'm just... Is, is it really a fate worse than death? It's terrible. It's the tragic fate worse than death. That's why we shouldn't give her the death penalty, which is actually just death, where you wouldn't get any of the things that I've just listed, which are terrible. They're like torture for her. So don't kill her. I don't get it. I'm not saying I'm in favour of the death penalty, but I just don't get the fate worse than death idea. Now, her incarceration is in the Administrative Segregation Unit in the Camille Griffin Graham Correctional Institution that's in Columbia in South Carolina. And I would say Susan Smith hasn't been the easiest prisoner. So in 2000, Smith, who was 28 at the time, she was disciplined for having sex four times with a 50-year-old prison guard, Lieutenant Houston Cagle. So the reason that she had to admit that she was having this sexual relationship is she tested positive for an STI. Not the easiest thing to get when you are literally locked up in prison. He actually pleaded guilty to this and he spent three months in jail. Obviously, it's disgusting that he was doing that. And I can also, to some degree, have a little bit of sympathy and empathy with a woman who wants sex, particularly when she's used that as a coping strategy her entire life. So I understand how these things play out and he is completely in the wrong because he's in employment there. But it shows that she's not very good with boundaries. The following year, I kid you not, somehow this happens again with a prison captain, Alfred Rowe. He also pleads guilty to having sex with Susan and he gets sentenced to five years probation. Not sure why he got probation and the other guy got custodial, but obviously better lawyer, one would imagine. Also, we have to make it clear, she is innocent here. She is meant to be protected whilst in prison and these are in authority. And we also can class this as one of those repeat cycles where she's been in a scenario where the individual in authority, her stepfather, has molested and abused her. So this is a typology that she's been used to. So it doesn't surprise me that she is seen as a vulnerable individual. And it doesn't matter how much she might have wanted it, because I'm sure she would want sex. She's been incarcerated for a long period of time it's a natural human instinct but they should know better now twice in 2010 and once in 2015 she ends up disciplined on drug charges so she loses privileges like the loss of visitation loss of canteen privileges and telephone privileges that was for over a year which worries me a little bit because bear in mind she's only taking responsibility for her actions in prison and she's not following boundaries and acknowledging that she has to act in an appropriate manner and then peace to resistance for me, 2015, she's like, mm, what should I do as somebody who takes full responsibility and accountability for the horrible crime I committed? I know, I will pen a letter defending myself to the state, which is a South Carolina newspaper. And she writes to this reporter, Harrison Kyle, and says, I am not the monster society thinks I am. Something went very wrong that night. I was not myself. I was a good mother and I loved my boys. There was no motive as it was not even a planned event. I was not in my right mind. Okay, I could dissect that for a lo very long period of time, and it worries me that she's saying this, because it's like saying that all murderers, aside from her, they are murderers because they just go around murdering all the time. Like, that's not the way it is. You're not a murderer 99.9% of the time. You just murder in that particular instant, and you did. And a loving mother doesn't allow her children to literally fall into a water in a car and drown horribly. Yeah, you might not have been in your right mind on reflection because you got caught for it, but you were in your right mind enough to make up a whole heap of rubbish about how it played out, trying to blame an innocent black man who, for all you know, could have been arrested and had the crime pinned on him. You had enough wherewithal in that moment to get it together enough to try to defend yourself against being caught. You spent nine days on TV protesting it, looking as guilty as hell in everyone's opinion, but that's not the point. You put an entire community through a huge amount of trauma because they thought those boys had been taken. And now, oh, I wasn't in my right mind. I was a really loving mother. You don't get to be a loving mother when you do what you did, which was to let them fall into the water that way. We're not talking about an Andrea Yates here. I've covered that video if you ever want to have a watch of that. She was somebody who was definitely dealing with postpartum psychosis. 
And even though that doesn't excuse killing, we understand what was playing out there. This is not the same. There is a cool calculation, in my opinion, to Sandra Smith's actions. You can say I'm wrong, and I will totally accept that and respect that. But for me, she wasn't in her right mind. Well, sure, you don't murder your children if you were in a normal, typical state of mind. But if you're in an antisocial mind, because maybe part of your personality has that potential trait, then arguably, yes, you could have acted in this way and regretted it purely because you got caught. David Smith, bear in mind that's the poor man who lost his children, he actually told People magazine that he's never, ever recovered from the pain. He said there's always this nagging, annoying heartache. He said it's always there every day, even if I'm not conscious of it. And that makes perfect sense. He's lost two gorgeous boys. Now, in 2017, Susan Smith's working as a prison landscape labourer. That was actually a step down from the position she previously had. She'd been a senior groundskeeper, but obviously she'd got into trouble at times, so therefore she'd lost certain privileges. Then in March 2018, she was promoted to ward keeper assistant. That was somebody who was responsible for the daily running of her prison housing unit. She also tutors other inmates. I mean, gosh, it's a fate worse than death, isn't it? Bear in mind, that's what they argued, isn't it, as a defence? Don't kill her. Just make her struggle in prison it will be a fate worse than death it doesn't sound like a fate worse than death she's basically got a job she's been respected she's found purpose i mean it doesn't sound like a fate worse than death anyway this is what she's doing whilst inside now at least six times from 2017 to 2019 smith has had some physical problems or some kind of issues have been severe enough to get her transferred to another facility for outpatient treatment. I haven't been able to find out what she's been treated for, but one can suggest that she hasn't been potentially very well. She also began a long distance relationship while still in prison with a divorced father of two, who wrote to Susan after seeing a documentary about her and her crimes. I mean, if we haven't all found ourselves in such a similar situation, there you are on Tinder, swiping right, swiping left. Maybe you're on Grindr doing the same. Maybe you're on a different platform altogether. eHarmony, for example. But arguably, we've all been there and we've thought to ourselves, these people, they're just, not, they're just not feeding my interest. They're not sparking my interest. They're not interesting enough. What I need is... A murderer of two children. That's what I need. So, yeah, just starts writing to her. Mm, you know, just going to throw it out there. This guy has two children. Yeah, just sitting here thinking about what I need for my future. I've got two kids. I love them dearly. I should probably think about introducing them to somebody who's murdered two children, said no rational human being ever in the history of human beings. I get it. I get he probably has a saviour complex and that he's looked at her background and thought she has become the person that she has become because of what happened to her and I can save her and give her a new direction, etc, etc. Or I don't know, maybe he was feeling psychologically wounded from his divorce and was like, well, maybe this way I'll know that she won't cheat on me, for example. Not saying that happened in his life, just saying if he did, maybe he would misguidedly believe that she wouldn't be having sex with somebody else in prison. That wouldn't work out either. But yeah, they write these handwritten romantic letters and some of them got obtained by news outlets and they were publicised. And Smith had actually written to him and said, I hope to get to see you face to face soon because she actually hopes that she's going to be released from prison shortly. Now, apparently the romance fizzled out after their love letters were made public. One imagines the whole family of his staged some kind of intervention and was like, this is why your relationships go wrong. This is the kind of reality that is depicting why things mess up in your life. You're literally communicating with a murderer. I imagine his ex-wife was sitting there going, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there you go. It's an example of why we failed. But anyway, after they'd probably grabbed him and rumbled him off somewhere for a period of months to make him rethink this idea, it kind of got called up. Now, like I said, she thinks she's going to be free and she has an upcoming parole. Bear in mind, she's only 52 years of age. 
And on the 4th of November 2024, which is almost just a year from where I am now, that will be her first opportunity. And apparently she feels ready to be released back into society. Sorry, this case is a horrific, heinous, terrible one, but it makes me smile because I'm like, again, she feels ready. You're going into the parole board and, yes, parole board, I just think you'll all be glad to know that I feel ready for release. I've thought about it, I've considered whether I've got to a point where society is suitable for me to return to. And I've considered it and I do like my life in prison. I have some nice jobs there and occasionally I get to have the odd dalliance. But at the end of the day, I'm thinking that maybe it's time to leave behind this world and venture to pastures new. So I feel ready. So if you could just... Uh, you know, stamp whatever needs to be stamped, sign whatever needs to be signed, and I'll just be on my way. Yeah, I'm ready. Anyway, that's how she feels. She's ready to be released back into society, so society better be ready for her. And she's been telling family members that she's a changed woman. Changed woman. And she's working very hard, apparently, to change the perception of her where society is concerned. And especially, quote, when it comes to a parole board. No shit, Sherlock. One imagines you would want to change the parole board's view of you because you murdered your children. But even her family are unconvinced about her being released from prison. In fact, one said, I don't think she's got a snowball's chance in hell of getting paroled in 2024. And obviously, David Smith, her ex, he thinks that too. And he said, she's exactly where she needs to be. I imagine for him, it would be very galling for her to have a chance at a second lifetime. Her family have actually been unwilling to give her any kind of help for her up and coming appeal. And John Onsment, the director of the South Carolina Department of Corrections, he says she'll always be a manipulative person. It's who she is. Osmond said, it is highly unlikely Susan will make parole, at least not the first time. So fundamentally, it could be that one day she actually will get to be free. Bear in mind, she murdered her two little boys. She allowed that car to roll into that water and they died in the most terrifying and horrific of ways. And yet she feels that she's ready for release. And again, when you think about manipulation, well, it does worry me a little bit. She manipulated the defence into arguing that it would be far worse for her to be put to death than it would be to be sent to prison. And people bought into that. And yet she seems to have done OK in prison to the point where she feels that she deserves to have a life outside of it. And that could mean that not only was she unbelievably manipulative in committing the crime, for the sole purpose of hopefully rekindling a relationship with a guy that she liked. But it could also mean that she is somebody who's manipulated the system so that she didn't get put to death and inevitably will have a chance to lead a whole lifetime again freely. Whereas those little boys, those absolutely gorgeous, innocent souls, they lost their lives in the most terrifying of ways. And that's the important thing at the end of this video for us to remember. Because Michael Daniel and Alexander Tyler, those two children were just beginning. They were beautiful little angels. And she chose to take their lives so essentially she could go on living hers. And for me, that's deeply conflicting when I think about her walking the streets again. Throughout her sentence, it doesn't feel like she's taken a lot of responsibility and accountability. It feels like she's deflected and said, well, it wasn't really me during that night. I didn't really mean to do it, in spite of the fact that she tried to pin the crime on a black man, even though that black man was never present. She used a racial bias, shall we say, in the system and the way that police view carjackers and will happily believe that it would be more likely for a black man to carry out that crime because of racial prejudice. She used that in the hope that that would deflect and prevent her from being found guilty prevent her even from being considered a suspect in the murder of the children that she took the lives of. And that is highly manipulative. Highly, highly manipulative. 
So before I end this video, let's just take a minute to remember Michael Daniel and Alexander Tyler, dedicate this video to them and remind ourselves that their lives had more meaning than the meaning that she could ever have to this world. And to just take a minute to sympathize and empathize with all those people who loved them dearly and never got to see them grow. This is for Michael and Alexander. Take care guys, be safe.